Recording and our last one. Ready. Yeah. I'm still doing. Still picking it up. Yeah. Fab's got Tom after Connor. All good? Yeah. Bye bye. Fab? Yeah. Techno World School is a school for autistic children and young adults and we have set this podcast up to provide our pupils with a fantastic opportunity to develop a range of skills whilst interviewing top sports men and women from a variety of different sports. Joining us today on the TWS Sports Podcast is a professional footballer. He plays for the best team in the world, Wolverhampton Wanderers, where he is the captain. He also plays for England. Welcome to the podcast, Connor Cody. Thank you for having me, mate. That's a lovely uh, introduction, that. Thank you very much. (laughs) We like to start our podcasts with um, some random questions before we start talking about your career. Are you ready? Of course I'm ready, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is the most famous person in your phone book? Well, that's a tough one, that's my phone book. In <laughs> uh, my phone book. <laughs> <laughs> you could have given me a heads up on the questions, by the way. Honestly, you could have given me a heads up on the questions. I honestly don't know. Uh, who we played with in the past? Harry Kane. Harry Kane. Don't get big on that. Yeah, true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Captain, yeah, Harry Kane, yeah. Right, uh, if you could trade lives with anyone for a day, who would it be and why? Uh, right. You probably heard this before. I love Prison Break. Me too. Right, do you like Prison Break? Yeah. What a series. Have you ever watched Prison Break? No. Yeah, I've seen bits oh, of it. Oh, yeah. what? You know what no. Prison Break? Honestly. It's good after. Go I home. <laughs> go home and fill your time with Prison Break. Michael Schofield. He's the main character, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, the main character. Proper, proper legend, mate. Watch it. Would you like to be in, in, in Prison Break? In Is Prison Break, yeah, 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 in Prison Break, yeah, yeah. Just because I love Prison Break, I've watched it about 300 times, mate. Do you reckon if the worst ever happened and you went to, went to prison, could you escape? <laughs> 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 if I was him, yeah, I couldn't, like, just be in me. <laughs> I couldn't be in me, mate. But, uh, yeah, I really like that programme, yeah. Um, so, if you could go back to one day in your life, what, you, what, you, uh, what would it be and why? Oh, there's a few. <clears throat> Football, there's obviously, I think the bear, I've got three boys, both of my children are brilliant. Uh, I, I keep it football terms because I could say that, but uh, I think getting promoted to the Premier League was massive for, for me as a footballer, mm. huge. That's, what, that's one of the big ones, but then scoring for England, mate, was was the one that just, I think, just tops, tops a lot, <laughs> mate, at Wembley. I, I would have loved for that, to go back to that, and that's to have a crowd in. I okay, scored yeah. behind closed doors. It's Wales, Wales? Oh, it's Wales, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I scored score behind, so I couldn't have let me, my wife, my kids, my family in there. So I'd love to go back to that, but have a full crowd in. Yeah. Um, thank you for answering those questions. Let's chat about your career. We want to take you back to the beginning and talk about your childhood. What are your memories of growing up, and did you always want to be a footballer? Always, for as long as I can remember, if I'm being honest with you, mate. I think it was something where my mum and dad were obviously huge for me growing up. They took me everywhere, football and wild. My dad was massive, and he was the one who really first started taking me, I think around four or five age of four or five so I've always wanted to be a footballer as long as I can live and I've loved football from the first day I started playing so so yeah I think that's the uh, that's the way I wanted to go growing up yeah. Um, you joined Liverpool when you were 12 years old at that age did you realise what a big club Liverpool was and what was your time in the academy like? Well what you just said they I think you must have got that from online because I actually started at Liverpool a lot earlier Okay. I don't, I've read that before, to be honest with you, and I don't know where somebody plucked 12 from. I started at Liverpool when I was about six, so that was something where, when you're a kid, you have, I think you go to, wherever you live, you go to a few clubs, if you, you know, like, so football, you go to, so I was at Liverpool, I was at Everton, all these different sorts of things, and I got the opportunity to sign for Liverpool, and I was a massive Liverpool fan, being a kid, and my family, and my parents, and my dad, they were really big Liverpool fans, so that was what really pushed me towards Liverpool, and listen, it was amazing, growing up there, and I think... Going back to that time when I'd done that, and from what I can remember, it was a, it was a long time ago now, I'm nearly 30 now, do you know what I mean? So, it was a long time ago, but it was an incredible moment of feeling, I think, for, 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 for me and my family. Yeah, I, I find that interesting, because like, I, I have a friend from primary school, and he, and he supports Liverpool, so also mm-hmm. shout out to Liverpool. So, it's kind of, <laughs> so it's kind of like awkward, because like, I, I've supported like, um, Wolves for like, quite a while now, mm-hmm. so like, it was, we always had like little banter there. Yeah, so, but yeah. It's just like that, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
So going back to Liverpool, what were your memories of the first team? And I presume it's around the Carragher, Gerard, Michael mm-hmm. in ages. It was Gerard Houdet, boss at the time. Yeah, was this support? You know, about support and Liverpool. When you were in the academy, once. Yeah, when I was in the academy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was in the academy, yeah, it was around. So they won. Liverpool obviously won the treble in two thousand and one, and it was that was obviously a big part because I think being a supporter, you enjoy watching your team obviously win trophies and win games and different things, and that was the time. And they were the kind of heroes for me. Stephen Gerrard was obviously a big one with with, with Jamie Carragher, who was a big influence on my career as my career moved forward through Liverpool. He was a massive, massive influence for me. But yeah, Michael and Robbie Fowler. These sort of, sorts of people were uh, were brilliant for me. Yeah. Um, so you won like the Euros with um, England team under seventeen. Um, what are your memories of that? Oh, I've got amazing memories of that, mate. Honestly, <laughs> amazing memories. That was the first proper time, really. That I think I understood competitive football. I think growing up for Liverpool, that you always want to be competitive, but they're never really for anything up until you get up to around sixteen, seventeen, and I started getting picked for England, which was. Which was amazing. We went to the Euros in in Liechtenstein. Actually, it was a tiny little country, and the team we had was amazing, mate. We had there was all kinds of players: Ross Barkley, Andre Wisdom player, Nathaniel Chalabert, Jack Butland was in goal. These sorts of players, they were fantastic players who went on to to have really really good careers in the game. But the semi final we played against Paul Pogba for France. That was the semi final. We won two one. So he was in the France team. I think Zuma was in the France team. He was now at West Ham, and then we went and played in the final against. Uh, do you remember Delafeu and? Lad called Paco Alcacer, who played at Valencia and different things. So these sorts of players in the final. So to win that makes I've got pictures. I still got the medal at home and different things. It was it was an amazing moment. Yeah. Um, how did the end of your Liverpool career happen? Did you not impress enough with your three minute appearance against Fulham? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to impress in three minutes, mate. Isn't it? It's hard to impress. No, I'll be honest with you. It it ended because. For one, I was lucky enough to, to train under Brendan Rodgers in the first team, so I was training with the first team, and it was amazing for me, so I was training and then playing for the reserves at the same time. And it kind of got to the point where I went on loan for a season to Sheffield United, and that was amazing for me, a fantastic club filled with brilliant people. And when I came back, I didn't want to go back to playing 23, so it was kind of my own choice because I was realistic in terms of being a footballer and how hard it was going to be to, to play continuously for Liverpool. So I had a conversation with Brendan Rodgers at the time, who, by the way, was absolutely amazing with me. Do you know what I mean? He, he was really honest and said, it's going to be hard, obviously, to play with Liverpool, but we'll help you find a new, another club and a new club, and we'll pick the right one for you. And, and he did. I, I ended up going to Huddersfield. So it was me being realistic. Loads of people say to me, oh, was it hard to leave Liverpool? It wasn't hard at all, because I just wanted to play football. I had a season of playing 50-odd games for Sheffield United in front of 20,000 people. We got to an FA Cup semi-final at Wembley, and it was the best thing that would ever happen to me. And, Liverpool were brilliant and it wasn't hard at all to leave, it was something that I really wanted to do. Uh, you joined Sheffield United on loan in 2013, do you enjoy your time there? Loved it mate, loved it more than more than anything because it was my first real opportunity of playing proper football, it was my first real opportunity of playing in front of crowds, playing for a team who were fighting for things every single week and we were in League One, it was a tough league, it was a tough season but the season that I had, like I said, I loved every minute. I played under Nigel Clough, who came in midway through the season, and I loved everything about working with him as well. He was fantastic for me. And like I said, we managed to go on a good run. We got to an FA Cup semi-final where we played at Wembley, and that day, mate, was incredible. There was little so we, we went into, we was obviously a League One team playing against Hull City, who we were in the Premier League at the time, mm. and we went in at half-time, 2-1 up, and we all just started laughing in the dressing room, <laughs> honestly, because yeah. it was kind of like, <clears throat> Sheffield United are close to getting to an FA Cup final. It was never known a League One team in an FA Cup final, and... It was an amazing day, I think, for the supporters and the team, but the memories I've got from that is that are absolutely amazing, mate. I loved it, yeah. Um, did you used to play centre midfield? How come you don't play it anymore? <laughs> Can you not tell that I would play that used to play centre midfield? <laughs> no, I did, mate. Yeah, I grew up playing central midfield. I always drop back every now and again to, 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 to centre back, but it was something that really helped me. If I, if I look back on my career now, and how I play now, that's something that really helped me. Obviously coming back and obviously seeing the game and having a little bit more time on the ball and seeing the game a lot more from the position I'm playing now, it really helped me. But I love playing central midfield. If I, if someone was to stick me back in there now, if the gaffer was to stick me back in there now, I'd struggle. Because I'm not fast enough, make my feet out fast enough like a, like a Ruben Neves or a Matinho. But I loved it, yeah, and it really helped me be the player I am today, I think. Now. Um, do you remember your first ever league goal you drifted into the box from the right hand side <laughs> and the ball came across to you and you slid in the past keep the keeper. Who wrote this? 
Is it? Because this is really lot, good. Lot of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I do remember. I do remember my first goal, and it was something where I've only really started going up for set pieces uh, this season, really under the gaffer, and I've, I've scored a couple this season. But I remember it was a little diving head at the back post. It was a, a great feeling, mate, at the South Bank, and it was something that I'll remember forever. Yeah, because it was uh, my first goal, man. Um, so you returned to Liverpool. What happened then? Your return after playing for Sheffield United. Like I said before, mate, it was something where I loved. I loved my time at Sheffield United. I actually really wanted to stay there. If I'm being honest with you, when I went back to Liverpool, I wanted to go back to Sheffield United because I loved it that much. I loved the people there. The supporters were fantastic. It was filled with really, really good people. But when we went back, I was really, I, I was realistic in terms of my chances of actually playing for Liverpool, and I didn't want to go back to playing reserve team football, 23s football. So I had a conversation with Brendan Rodgers, who, who was fantastic, and he was very honest with me, very realistic, and I basically said, us as a club, we'll, we'll find you the right club. And I had a couple of clubs at the time which I could have gone to, but going to Huddersfield was was a real, real good thing for me and something that I really appreciate from Liverpool as well because they were massive in terms of sending me there as well. So that was the conversation, really. It was nothing spectacular or clever about it. He was just really honest with me. Um, number 10, yeah? Yeah. You then joined Huddersfield in 2014. How did that move come across about and how did and did you enjoy it? Loved it. Loved it again. It was a, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to say that during my career I've been part of some incredible football clubs, football clubs filled with brilliant people who make you want to go to work every day, make you want to go to football and work hard and train every day and Huddersfield was no different when I went there, I've, I've still got friends for life who, who were still there, who have played there when I was there and left and different things and to see what they're doing now is fantastic and how close obviously they are now to the Premier League and the playoffs and different things but it was just a, a top club filled with good people who supporters and a lot of working class people who wanted you to do well and like I said I, I owe a lot of credit to Liverpool for really helping me pick that club and choose that club to go to because it helped me so, so much going there. So after that, you then joined Wolves? Yeah, yeah a Wolves. year later, mate, yeah. And they went, I'm aware I think in that season, the season before, they just just missed out of the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. So moving to Wolves, how did that kind of come about? And It was massive. I got a phone call one day when I was at Huddersfield and no one really knew about it apart from myself, just saying that Wolves are really interested in taking you, obviously, at the end of the season. And straight away, I, I said to myself that, That'd be, that'd be incredible, that. that'd be incredible. Just because I'd played against Wolves for, for a couple of seasons, the season before, and I knew how good of a team they had, how big of a club it is, the supporters from playing at Molyneux, I knew how big they were as well. So I just thought to myself straight away, that'd be a fantastic move for me, that and something that I'd really want to do. And luckily, it got done quite good because Huddersfield were really wanted it to happen in terms of, obviously, financially, maybe for them or whatever it might have been. And it was something that I really wanted to jump at the chance of, and I did do that. And looking back now, it was the best thing I've ever done in my life. I spoke that so was that Kenny Jacket? Yeah, Kenny Jacket, yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you know what? The first couple of seasons were tough because obviously the lads had gone from just missing out in the playoffs and getting promoted to, to the Premier League on goal difference then having a couple of dodgy seasons when, when I first came in. And, and it was tough because we were trying to find consistency, we, we were trying to find momentum, but obviously after a couple of years, a little bit of a... It, it, it's gone obviously well since then. What was it about Wolves that made you want to join? Everything. Everything, like I said, I'd, I'd played against them. I grew up, obviously knowing Wolves in the Premier League, watching Liverpool play against Wolves in the Premier League and then I, I had the privilege of playing against Wolves for, for obviously Sheffield United and Huddersfield the previous couple of seasons and I loved every minute about playing there, I actually scored at Molyneux in one of the, one of the games and I loved the feeling of coming out at Molyneux, I loved what the crowd brought, I loved the size of the club and coming to play against them and, and I always thought to myself, imagine playing for this club, how good it would be, do you know what I mean, it was that sort of thing so there was a lot of things that attracted me to it and like I said from the very first conversation that I had it was something that I wanted to jump at the chance of. Uh, what was your first season for Wolves like? Tough, tough. I'll be honest, the first couple of seasons when I, when I first come was tough because we were a little bit up in the year. We were very inconsistent in terms of how we were playing and what we were, how we were trying to play and, uh, and the style of play that we, that, that we were trying to bring out. But it was a real, real learning curve because I was still young. I was still about 22, 23 at the time. And it was something that really helped me build, I think, not just as a football player, but as a person as well. So the first couple of seasons were hard, but then obviously the owners come in and, and had new ideas, and it was something that I really wanted to be a part of. We heard that you uh, went to Austria on a 
pre-season with Wolves in uh, 2017, you left the airport as a third choice midfielder and after sitting next to the manager on the flight, you landed in Austria as the first choice centre-back and club captain. How does it feel to be a teacher's pair? <laughs> <laughs> so the story to that is, you probably heard that, so you probably got that from, was I was sat on the plane and to be fair, we trained there a couple of weeks before, so... The manager played me at centre back in training a couple of times, so it was kind of like, is he thinking about putting me there? Is that where he's thinking of playing me? If he is, I'll give him the best of what I've got. I'll I'll try and improve him every single day. So we were sat obviously on the plane, and as he's walking down here, the aisle I could see, obviously, I uh, an empty seat next to myself. I was in the middle of an empty seat next to myself. I don't know what you're thinking to yourself. Oh, I hope the manager doesn't sit there. <laughs> and obviously, as he's walking down the aisle, he's getting closer and closer and closer and closer, and then he's just kind of got eye contact with me and said, "Hey." It's, yeah, yeah, sit there, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we literally sat, and, and honestly, I, I know it's a bit of a funny story, and it's something that lads take the mick out of me of at the time and different things, but the conversation that he had with him was, was incredible, and he never spoke about me in a, in a positional sense either, by the way, on the flight. It was more about what he wanted to do with the football club and how he wanted to make the football club better, and the trip to Austria was really, really big for us because it brought us together as a team. It was a hard, real hard trip, but that whole story and that whole trip came from, from obviously what he wanted to do, which was brilliant, yeah. So yeah, we've got a, I'm, I'll say a good friend, we've had Dave Edwards on the podcast. Oh yeah, 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 I'm good mate to that. And yeah. Um, yeah, we listened to it in the, in the Stiffs yeah, 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 podcast yeah. and yeah, we heard that story, so we've talked yeah. a bit to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got promoted in 2018. Yeah. So obviously an incredible season. What was the end of the season? I can't remember, were you champions at playoffs? Yeah, we were champions, yeah. yeah, we were champions. Mate, honestly, that season, I think if you speak to a couple of lads who were involved in that season as well, like we speak to Ruben all the time and... Ruben Nevers and obviously what he's done in his career now with a football player is he still ranks that season as probably one of his his favourite ever season, the one he's enjoyed the most because the way we went into games, feeling that we couldn't get beat, the the feeling that we had mentally, physically, we felt that like we could play, we felt we had a way of playing, we felt every game we could go and win and that season was absolutely incredible, mate. And I just think the way the boys approached it, the way the club approached it, the way the lads who come in at the start of the season approached it was amazing and it's something that I've got memories for life for, for me, my family, for my children. They speak about that season now, my wife speaks about it all the time and it was an incredible moment for the football club and just to obviously give us that kind of boost that we needed obviously going into the Premier League with the way we played that season was fantastic. And it might sound like a stupid question, I'm a Cardiff City fan so mm. I've seen a lot of championships and then get promoted. Mm. Is the championship harder than the Premier League in a way? Physically, physically. Uh, Physically, because it's so demanding in terms of you know what the rewards are at the end of the season. There's a lot of pressure. Obviously, I think if you're part of a club who are expected to, to go up to it, expected to challenge, I think if you don't challenge, the pressure ramps up a little bit. And I think that becomes hard as well. I think the technical side of the Premier League and the speed and how people play in the Premier League is, I think, it's the best in the world. I don't think you can compare it to anything. But I just think in terms of what's at stake in the Championship, I think... You can really feel that at times, and we certainly felt in the first couple of seasons I had at this football club that this club was expecting to challenge, and we wasn't. And then when we did, the force of the people behind, the force of the supporters behind, is something that I can't really tell you about because it's like a bit of an out of body experience the way you feel at times. Yeah. Um, you had a great first season with Wolves in the Premier League. What would you put that success down to? I think the mentality, I think the mentality of the football club, the mentality of the manager at the time, the mentality of the players in, in how we approached that. We said to ourselves when we got promoted, I mean, that, that we didn't want to just come up and be another number. We didn't want to just come up and, and say we've been promoted and say, oh, we're in the Premier League. We didn't want to do that. We said to ourselves, we want to go and hit it and hit it as hard as we can to improve, to, to really show that we'll belong in the Premier League. And we said that from the day we got promoted to obviously now. We keep on saying that to ourselves now. And I think that was the big part of it. The mentality of the club was was second to none. It was incredible, I think, the way we approached it and the way we went about it. We never changed. I think if you watch the championship season, we never ever changed the way we played, what we'd done. We got better and better and better at what we wanted to do. And I think you still see that to this day now. The mentality of the football club is exactly the same. Um, the following season, you had a great spell in Europe with Wolves. How special was it to play in Europe with Wolves and do really well in the competition? For me... That was the best season we've had since I've been here, just because of that European, the European adventure that we had was. It's hard to put into words because the club had waited so long, I think, to get themselves into that position for us to get ourselves in that position, and I don't think we actually believe we'd done it 
up until a few weeks after, obviously we finished seventh the previous season. I don't think we'd actually realise what we'd done. And it was an incredible moment to see world supporters travelling all over Europe, all over the world to to watch us play football, to to experience other places, to experience other countries, other food, other atmospheres, other stadiums was was absolutely incredible. Honestly, it was, it was the best season I think we've had in a long, long time at this football club, just because of the way the boys approached it and the way they went about it. And yeah, it was it was it was an amazing season, full of incredible memories, mate. Yeah. Uh, you make your England debut in twenty twenty twenty. What what was like that like? Hey, well, you're bringing up some good times here, really, aren't you? It's hard to it's hard to speak about it. Yeah, uh, when I first got the call, I'll be honest with you. Before before I got picked for England, I always used to sit, and I didn't know how it used to used to happen when you got picked for England. I didn't know whether you get a phone call, whether you just see it on the telly or different things. I didn't know, so I used to always sit and watch that Sky Sports News when the England squads were going out and I was never ever getting in it but I still sit in front of the telly and watch it and this was no different for this one and I actually got called up a bit later because someone dropped out at the time on me on my first call up and the feeling gives you goosebumps mate. I was actually out on the phone with my children and I got a phone call off Gareth Southgate at the time and it was a bit surreal I mentioned before about an out of body experience that's what that was because I actually stood there on the phone talking about meeting up with England the following week was something a dream something I've thought about a million times over in my head and to actually finally get that phone call was incredible mate. Every time I, I get picked from them, every time I put on an England shirt, an England training kit, whatever that may be, it's the proudest moment in my life mate. So so yeah, it was it was an incredible moment, yeah. So what's it like meeting up with England? Because you hear retired players now like Gerard, Carragher, Lampard, they say there was quite a rivalry yeah. when England met up. It doesn't seem like that anymore. I've heard them stories mate and listen, I weren't around in the era that they were playing and what a team they had and but it's hard to kind of imagine that now with what I experience when I go, if you know what I mean, because I can't tell you how good it is, mate. I spoke about it a million times before, and a lot of people said to me, even in the summer when we went to the Euros, that I didn't play, that must have been hard, and all, all this sort of stuff. And I said to myself, the best few weeks of my life, the best few weeks of my life because of how the lads are, I think because of how the staff are, how the environment is. No one wants to be in the room, everybody's always out, whether you're playing table tennis, whether you're playing basketball, whether you're playing golf, whether you're having a coffee, whether you're... No one's ever in the room. It's, it, it, it's mad. The, the feeling you go is like being in a club environment when you go, and I really, really mean that. So I hear them stories as well. I listen to a lot of old players speaking about being with the national team and different things, and I find it hard to obviously think about what it was like then because I experience what it's like now, and the feeling of it, mate, it's, it, it's unbelievable, yeah, it's unbelievable. What is the step up like from club to country in terms of level and ability? Uh, I'll be honest with you, mate, I think... The level at Wolves is is incredible. I'm lucky enough that I get a chance to train and play with these with these boys every single day. And when you go to him, it really sets you up training and playing with the lads here because you go there and listen, it's an incredible level at England. And I think most lads would tell you it's an incredible level when they go to Portugal, whether you go to Morocco, whether you go to Mexico, whatever whatever that may be. It's an incredible level. But because of the way we train here, and the intensity that we train at, and the intensity that the manager wants and the tempo that he wants, it really sets you up for going there. So I don't think it's a massive step up, but I think at the same time, what we train like here really helps us go in there as well. At Euro 2020, the England coaching team said you were player of the tournament. You didn't play any games, but they said you were important in the dressing room. What did you do during that tournament that was so helpful? Do you know what? When I first heard that, mate, I was a bit embarrassed, I'll be honest with you. I was a bit embarrassed because it was Steve Holland who said it. Who, uh, I really, really get on with. I respect him so much. I think he's, he's an incredible football co coach. So when I seen that, it was kind of a little bit like it was, it was a proud moment. But at the same time, I was a little bit, yeah, a, li a little bit embarrassed. Because obviously, you've got lads who were performing incredibly well on the football pitch, and I had so many people come up to me and and say and, and say to me, oh, "You never played. You never done this." And like I've just said, there, they were the best few weeks of my life. And I just told myself that when I went, whether I was going to play, whether I was going to miss out, whatever it may be, that I was going to give the best of myself every single day to. To try and make the team, the country, the the players around me better because we were all in it for one thing. How long have we all waited? I think for for our country to win something, we waited since '66 or to get to a final and to actually see after the couple of years that we had with COVID as well and we spoke about it a lot there. What we could actually bring the country and what the lads brought the country was incredible. So it was nothing that I don't do here that I done there. I, I do th I do things the exact same here every single day, but I just made sure that I went there and. Every single trainer, I've done everything right. Every single trainer, I worked as hard as possibly could to, to try and make the players around me better. And if I was to play, great, let's go and do my stuff and try and win as many games as possible. If I wasn't, then I'll try and make him better, him better, him better, to try and make us go as far as we can in the competition. And 
we got to where we wanted to go, we just couldn't quite get over the line with it. So it's, I think it's an exciting future, I think, for, for the national team, but then, 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 then for you, we can make but some of the best in my life, yeah. That's a perfect analysis on that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have heard that people say you never stop talking when you are playing football and you talk so much. Is this true? And do your teammates understand Scouse? <laughs> 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 I think you can. I think you can probably see it from from this now. I don't stop talking. That's something that I quite enjoy. I can speak about football all day, mate. I can speak about football all day, and the lads will probably tell you I do the reds in. If I'm being honest with you, I'm quite loud and I'm quite over the top, really, with them. But I think it's a massive part. I think I, I think probably not just football, but I think probably society's probably gone away from communicating a little bit. If I'm being honest with you, I say it quite a lot. And you get phone, you get Instagram, you get Twitter, and you get all these sorts of things now. And no one really wants to speak anymore. Do you know what I mean? No one really wants to talk. And I, I, I think I, I speak to our young lads here quite a lot and just say it's a massive part of life and it's a huge part of football. I think if you can get it into your game, I think it's huge. And I'm lucky that it comes quite natural to me that I want to try and help people. But I think if other people start doing it as well, it can help them even more. So I think it's a massive part of it. The lads are... But see, the Portuguese lads don't understand me. <laughs> Half the time, I think it's just noise to them, mates. I'm saying things on the picture, I'm saying things in the change room, and they're just looking at me, and it's going in one ear and out the other, and it's like, yeah, I like codes or whatever, but they don't understand me, mate, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> what is your opinion of swapping shirts after a game? Is it something you do? And if so, what is the best shirt you, you have? Good question. I've done it, yeah. I've done it. I've got quite a few shirts. Um, I'm a big believer in, I think you should do it behind closed doors. Do you know what I mean? Because I think when you're in it, the half-time ones I don't get. I don't understand swapping at half-time. Never get me head round that. I don't know why you'd so Even if you've got Cristiano Ronaldo and you're desperate for a shirt to leave, it's like to speak to something, I don't know. Just I don't understand swapping at half-time. After the game, I do it behind closed doors. So all the shirts I've got, I've never kind of done it in a tunnel or whatever. I've kind of given it to our kit man and said, oh, well, you get that one or whatever. So I've got quite a lot of shirts, if I'm being honest. I've got some good ones. I've got uh, Kevin De Bruyne was a real big one that I've got on the wall at home. Uh, I've got a couple of our lads actually on the wall at home. I've got quite a few of Rubens from when he was in Europe. I've got a Ruben Portugal one, which is top draw. I've got a Trent one, I've got a Declan Rice one, Kyle Walker, Jamie Vardy. I've got and then I've got quite a lot of my own ones where obviously I've been lucky enough within games to, to wear the armband with England. So I've got like my own shirt, obviously thing with the captain's armband underneath which is a which is a lovely one as well. So uh, so yeah there's, there's a few my favourite one's probably De Bruyne. What a player. What a player, mate. What a player. One of the best in the world, and he's so. I'll take the point. Uh, what is Conor Cody like after he has lost oh. a football match? Oh. <laughs> Terrible. Awful. Ask me wife, mate. I'm, I'm awful. <laughs> I'm awful. Even after the game on the weekend, I was awful when I go home. I don't really speak. And do you know what? It shouldn't be like that, if I'm being honest with you. You shouldn't really take on. Sometimes it, it's very hard because you're so emotionally involved in a football match that you're desperate mm. to win. Your competitive side comes out and. You're so desperate to win and I feel sorry for my wife and my children at times because I go home and my children are expecting to play and they want to play football or they want to do this or they want to play FIFA or whatever it may be and I go home I've got a face on me and it's hard and it shouldn't be like that really but it's hard to get out of that mode, mode I think when you're so emotionally involved in a football match yeah so I'm tough after a win I'm on top of the wheel mate. I'll play FIFA all night with the kids or I'll play foot <laughs> in the garden all night so uh, I'd rather speak about that one. <laughs> <laughs> so what about your pre-game routine so say it's Saturday 3 o'clock kick off mm. What's your kind of rough routine from when you wake up? Uh, I'm quite an early bird, if I'm being honest with you. So I'm not quite here. I like, I like trying to have it. If it's a three o'clock kickoff, I like trying to have two meals. If it's a late kickoff, I like trying to have three meals. I try, I try and eat because a lot of lads would rather sleep sometimes, so they'd rather miss breakfast and just have pre match meals. So we have pre match meals around about three hours before the kickoff. So I'd get up and breakfast is usually optional. I'd get up for breakfast about eight, half past eight. So I'll have my breakfast and then I like to go for a walk get out of the hotel and get a bit of fresh air, get a bit of a coffee with a couple of the lads and a couple of the staff members, the physios over here, which is always quite good fun actually, because you sit and you have a little bit of a chat and you have a coffee and then you're back then for a quick shower, pre-match meal. Me pre-match and everybody can't get their heads around this, like when I first went with England. So my pre-match meal is pancakes and fruit, honestly. <laughs> honestly, oh, nice. so everybody has yeah, like, pasta, spag ball, do you know what I mean, potato, all this sort of stuff. And when we first went with England, they never had pancakes. So I said to the nutritionist, listen, <laughs> you've got no pancakes. And I was playing, so he was like, don't do pancakes at pre-match. I went, I can't have nothing else at pre-match. I can't like have pasta or nothing like that. Like, I'm just not used to it. Like I'm quite set in my ways. So he was like, pancakes and fruit. So I was like, yeah, that's what I want. And that's all I'll have. And the lads are like, that's all you're having. I'm like, yeah, that's all I want. So he had to do me pancakes every time we go to England now. And 
yeah. I'm lucky enough to be picked. We have pancakes on, so that's my pretty much meal, the, 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 the pancakes. And then it's obviously just getting in the zone then really for the game and focusing on obviously who you're coming up against, the, the sort of players you're coming up against, what's that striker do, what's his strengths, what's his weaknesses, all this sort of thing. And just being in the zone for the game, but I'm quite relaxed. If I'm being honest with you, I talk quite a lot, I waffle. <laughs> so I waffle on quite a bit, so I'm quite relaxed before a game. Any superstitions? Yeah. Uh, not necessarily things that I stick to every week. This might sound a bit daft, but say we play on the Saturday and we win. I'll always try and retrace my steps the next Saturday, <laughs> right? And that might sound ridiculous, right? But even to the, to the bit of, I'll try and use the same toilet if I go to the toilet, or I'll try and put the shim, me right shim pad on me left. I'll try and retrace my steps a little bit. It's never right. I never retrace <laughs> my steps. I just feel like I'm, I am retracing my steps. It's daft, I know, but I just think that's the mode you get into when... You're just desperate to win, mate. I just think that's what it's like. Yeah. Uh, what is your your best quality as a captain? I think communication, mate. We've spoke a lot about it, I think, during this podcast. But I think communication is a big part of it. Like I said, I, I honestly believe a lot of it's going out of the game. I think a lot of it's going out of society. There's so much, I think, going on, like I said, with phone, social media, all this sort of stuff. I think it's going out of it. And like I said, I, I speak a lot to our young lads about it. I'll just talk and open your mouth. Don't come in and head down and come in and say morning and all these different things. And have a chat. It's, Nothing better than hearing about someone's life or what they've been up to or what they're doing, or the way they're going on holiday or whatever they're doing. I think it's a massive part of it. So communication and being open for me is massive, yeah. Mm. Um, do you want to be a manager in the future? <sighs> right, it's a tough question, that, for me. I'd love to. I'd love to, but I'd have to really believe that I can affect people. I'd have to really believe that I'm good at it. I, w- I wouldn't just want to go into being a manager if I didn't feel ready, if I didn't feel good enough, because it's such a hard job. I see it from the managers I've played under. It's a real tough job, and you'd want, you want to be a really successful manager. That's what everybody wants to do, and everybody will tell you the same thing. I understand it, but you've got to believe you're good enough. I've got to believe I'm good enough. I wouldn't just go into it if I'm half-hearted or I've not learned as much as I can. I'd have to be really prepared to go into it. So I would be. I, I would want to, but I'd have to be really, really prepared to, to do it because I wouldn't want to leave myself short. Because then that can kill you then for for the rest of your life and and and, and the football club, you know. You doing your badges or that's something? You're... Yeah, I'm in, I'm in the middle of doing my B at the minute, so I'll, I'll I'll get them. I want to do them and I want to learn more about it. If you were to say to me now, right, would you go and be a manager tomorrow? I'd say no because I'm nowhere near ready for something like that. So and I've got a lot of learning to do because I really believe it's totally different to being a player. It's totally totally different. I think a lot of people think oh, if you play in the Premier League or you played football, you could necessarily go straight into being a manager. I think there's so much more to it than being a football player. So. I am doing my badges and it's something I'm enjoying at the minute. So hopefully we can we can get them in and see where we're at. I think what you said it's at the moment we're in a <coughs> stage where you got Rooney, mm. Gerard, Lampard, Vieira, mm. who have kind of seemed from the point of view of the public to make the transition quite easy. Yeah. But um, yeah, you're right. It's just obviously not easy. There's loads of footballers who never do, quite do, made do, it. And, and I think people, I honestly think people that people think oh, he's been a player, so I think he'll be a man. I think it's so much more than that. And, I honestly think you've got to really them them players now managers who you just mentioned they're incredible incredible footballers but they're also showing how prepared they are as managers as well because they're all doing ever so well so I think there's so much more to it than being a footballer just thinking well I've played in the Premier League I've done it all right so I can go and be a manager and I think there's so much more to it than that. Um, Jamie Carragher likes to wind you up on TV. <laughs> Would you ever like to be a pundit on TV and get your own back on Jamie? It's not just on TV. You wear <laughs> yeah. I get messages on my phone all kinds about something I've done wrong in a game or whatever it may be. It's not just on TV. He's a real good friend of mine. I'll be honest, like, I'm really, really close to him. And he, he's a fantastic person and, and a brilliant character. And, and I'm really open to that. I really enjoy doing that, if I'm being honest with you. I've, done, I've dipped my toes in a little bit, doing a few little things here and there whenever I've been asked because I'm really privileged to be asked, I think, first and foremost. But second, secondly, I really enjoy it. Like... We spoke here now for however long about football, and I could do that all day long because that's the one thing in my life that, that I love doing. So if anybody asks me what, to speak about football, I'll do it all day long. So I am really open to that idea because I really enjoy it, and I see the work he's doing as well, which which is doing a fantastic job, but I am really, really open to that idea, yeah. Because you did Monday Night Football once yeah, last I done, year? Yeah, I've done it with him, yeah, I've done it with him, and mate, honestly, I loved it. You sit there, you analyse games, you speak about football, you, you talk about the weaknesses, the positives, the negatives, whatever it may be, you speak about it. And then you speak about it on air, and it's it, it, it it's a fantastic and that was a brilliant experience for me. So it was something I really really enjoyed, and as I mentioned, that's something I'm really open to. But again, it's it's making sure that you're prepared for, for for whatever you're going into. And what about as a as a player individually and as a dressing room? If you're watching match of the day, BT Sport, Sky Sports, and mm. somebody's slamming you, kind of go to a terrible performance. Did this one, this one, this one. 
Do you listen to that? Do you, yeah. Does it affect you? Yeah, of course, because like I said, I'm so, I'm so invested, I think, in... I'm bad for it, really. I, I read the news and I read Sky Sports News and I, I read, I'll wait, it'll be the first thing I do when I wake up, to be honest with you. And it's, it's something that you probably shouldn't do as a footballer because you're always open to criticism as well you are from the, from the positive feedback as well. So, But it's something that I'm saying. I think most football footballers see it as well because football is such a big sport now. Everything is everywhere. So when somebody's speaking about your football club, you kind of latch onto it straight away. And then if someone's speaking about one of your teammates or yourself, you latch onto it even more. So it's something that I do. It's something that you don't want to think about the, weak, the the weaknesses that you have or the poor performance that you have but sometimes you've got to learn from them, you've got to be man, man enough and strong enough to learn from them because we're part of a game that's probably the biggest sport in the world and we understand that millions and millions of people watch it and that you're there to, to play under pressure to make your football club better so I think it's important that you learn from it so whenever that does come it's, it's seeing it, learning from it. Does it on. go too far though? So I'm thinking of Harry Maguire at the moment, he's yeah. slammed. Yeah, and yeah I, I, I don't get it mate, I don't get it, I don't get it, I'll be honest with you and like I said I think being a footballer, I think you open yourself up to these things and you open yourselves up to criticism. But some of the things I read about the gates at the minute, I just think are absolute madness. And I understand, I understand as well that he's also at Manchester United. He's the captain of Manchester United, one of the biggest roles you can probably have in the world at that football club. And he's a fantastic person and he's a fantastic, I think he's a fantastic footballer as well. So to see the kind of stick that he gets, I, I, I don't get it, I'll be honest with you, I really don't get it. Um, no. We heard that you once sang the Fresh Prince of Ballet. No, 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 no. Go on. Go on, yeah, go on. Can you sing for us now? I can't, I can't sing that. I'm not, but you're not preparing me for this. You're not preparing me for it. Can you, do you know it? The, the, I know the story, like... Now this is a story all about, about how my life, life got, got flipped and upside down, down and I'd like to take a minute just sit yeah, right there yeah. I'll tell you how I gave a bit of the time come yeah. Yeah. That one, yeah, that one, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was my initiation song, yeah. So when I first come, you'll see most clubs you go to, you'll have to do an initiation song and I'm rubbish for music and different things. And they said, and I used to watch Fresh Prince of Bel-Air all the time, so I knew that, you know, you kind of catch it. So I sang that one in my initiation song, yeah, so... I've said it a few times and then you go on radio and different things and they ask you to say, sing it and it just puts you on the spot. <laughs> like you just kind of done there with me. <laughs> At least you joined in. I like it. Oh, you. We have a quick game we would like to play with you before we finish, if that is okay. We typed, uh, does Connor Cody into Google and this is the questions Google came up with. <laughs> oh, then, yeah. Okay, so the first one is, does Connor Cody speak Portuguese? Uh, bits, not, I should, it should be more. I'm, I'm, I think back and I think I'm quite lazy, so little bits and half my swear words, if I'm being honest with you, so I probably can't say I'm on it, but little bits, so there's little bits in training that the gaffer will say, so the gaffer speaks a lot in Portuguese, we've got a lot of Portuguese players, so like, uh, so he says spera, which means wait, he says maizuma, which means one more, so say we're doing set pieces, he'll go maizuma, so I understand vera, I think it's turn, so there's ways that the lads will say in training, and I kind of understand. I'll never say them because they just take the mick out of me. <laughs> Scouts Portuguese, man, you know what I mean? So they kind of take the mick. But the odd word, yeah, but it, sh it should be more. As a, as a club, obviously, Wolves is very dominant with Portuguese and, and mm. British players. Does that, does that help having a group of players from the same sort of country? Oh, I love it, mate. I love it. I think it's... More importantly, I, I, I think we should highlight the fact that how adaptable the players are who come over here. I mean, we talk about... I, I mention him quite a lot, but I speak about Ruben quite a lot, who come over, I think, at the age of whatever it was, 20, something like that, whatever age it was, and he came over with his young family and kind of just settled in straight away. And I don't think people understand how hard that is sometimes, I think, for young players coming over to a different country to actually settle in so fast. And I love every part of it, because then the, the boys who come in want to make the club better, they want to make themselves better, and it's an incredible environment, right? Um, does Connor Cody live in Wolverhampton? <laughs> <laughs> so I do, yeah, I do. My wife and kids still live back home. Because just to be around family, because it's actually not too far. I think people think it's absolutely miles away. It's actually not too far. So I live here, and I go home whenever I can and different things. But my wife and children still live back home, just to be around family and have the kids around family and different things. So yeah. Um, does Co Connor Cody qualify to play for Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> it's an Irish name, isn't it? I got asked actually when I was younger. I got asked actually when I was younger, and I, and I think we actually looked into it a little bit. But no, I don't. I think it's like. My great 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 grandparents or whatever it may be, that sort of it goes too far out, do you know what I mean? So I don't qualify to play <laughs> play for Ireland now, but the question did get asked a few years ago, yeah. Uh, the fourth one on Google was one after. Uh, do you do you kinda of call the eat junky food? <laughs> 
junk food. Yeah. <laughs> I do, right. So people always say about like, oh, do, do you eat well? And do you... We eat sensible. Do you know what I mean sensible? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. when we're training and when we're when we're working, do you know when I do eat junk food after yeah. a game? Because you always say like you burn that much energy and that much yeah. stuff in a game that after a game you need to refuel as quick as possible. And the kind of like, well, you, you might have heard a story where you kind of have pizzas after a game. Mm. That's kind of quite common, really. Do you know what I mean? So mm. I still try and eat as well as I can, but if I have a cheat day, my cheat days after a game, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your choice of cheat meal? Indian. I go chicken, like korma. I go a uh, korma. So a bit of naan bread, all that sort of stuff. I go Indian. You're not, you're not a hot man. Oh, I'm not a hot man. <laughs> I'm not a hot man. Not a hot man. No. Um, Wolves have finished top ten a few times recently, but never quite made it into the top six. What do Wolves need to do to make the top six? Believe. I think that's a massive part of it, mate. Believe. Because I think you get to a point where, like you said, we've finished seventh a couple of seasons. We're now in eighth at the minute. And I think we've got to have that belief to really go and cr try and crack it because... I think we've had some fantastic opportunities this season that we haven't taken. And I think back to it now and just feel if we believed a little bit more and believed where we were and that we actually deserve to be in the position that we are, fighting for, for obviously what's ahead of us, I think that would have been better. I think belief is a ma massive part of it, mate, and I think it's something we need to start doing a lot more. Uh, what are you hoping for this like um, World Cup? Can England win this year? Like, <coughs> a, a, a lot of people have asked me the question and I've got to say, yeah because I really believe that as a country we can, because I feel like the players are incredible, I feel like the feeling within the environment is incredible, I feel like the manager is absolutely fantastic and his staff, so I, I've got to say yeah, and especially because of what we've done last year in the, in, in the summer as well, but I just feel the feeling behind the national team at the minute is incredible, and I, and I think that's something that can really push us from being part of teams who have done well in the past, that was a massive part of it, having a full force of not just a city, but an actual country behind you pushing. You can be absolutely incredible. So I really believe we can. I really, really do. And it's what's supposed to go and try and have a little goal. So I ask. I know it's in Qatar this year. I'm not going to ask you about the reasons behind Qatar because it's nothing to do with you. But in terms of it being in the winter or our winter, hmm. mid, mid, middle of the season, boiling hot. What are your thoughts on the World Cup coming up in terms of preparation and diff completely different environment? I feel you can look at it in both ways, if I'm being honest. I think from probably a manager's point of view, you're probably going, I've not got enough time to prepare with the players. Because I think the Premier League season finishes and then a week later, I think the first World Cup game is. And I think for a manager, they'll probably turn around and go, that's not enough time to prepare because usually you have two, three, four weeks to prepare for, for, for a major tournament. So I think probably from their point of view and probably some other people within the world are saying it's not enough time. But I think from a player's point of view, you want to go straight into it. Players just want to play football. Players just want to be part of these big tournaments as much as possible. And I think most people will probably tell you the same thing, that you want to prepare, you want to make sure you're ready, but you want to go into it as quick as you possibly can to try and hit the ground running, to try and play. And It's not as if we're finishing a season and having a week or so off to then go again. We're kind of stopping a Premier League season, flying straight out, and then off you go, you're into a, into a World Cup. So I think you can look at it in both ways. I think from a player's point of view, you want to get into it as fast as you possibly can and hit the ground running as quick as you possibly can as well. Every week on the podcast, we like our guests to ask questions to each other. <laughs> so we get a guest to ask a question, but they have no idea who the question is going to be for. This week's, week's questions comes from our previous guest, who has former Wolves and West Ham player Matt Jarvis. He asks, who has been the biggest influence on your career and why? Right, so... Yeah, there's a couple. My me, me dad's the biggest influence on my career, my dad. He's a massive influence because of what he's done. I mentioned earlier on that from the age of four all the way up to now, he comes to every single game. He's always been to every single game. I don't know how many he's missed in his life, but it's not it's not many. So he's a massive influence. I think if I go to coaches, I had a coach when I was younger at Liverpool called Frank McPartland who really, really believed in me. Really believed in me, not just as a football player, but I think as a person. And I'm still I'm really good friends with him. I was with him the other day having a coffee and something to eat. And he's a real factor into why I'm, I'm a professional footballer now, so I'd say my dad's the first and biggest one, but then Frankie, who was my old coach at Liverpool, was a massive one as well. Um, could you do the same please? Uh, can you think of a question for our next guest, but we aren't going to tell you who the guest is, the question could be anything you want. Can't we've, had not. we've had a random, very random question, mate. anything. Have you? Will the next guest be sports or anything? All sports, yeah. All sports. Any, any sports? Yeah. Flipping heck. 
<laughs> favourite film, favourite hobby, favourite. Yeah. Where's the favourite place to go on holiday? Perfect. That's, That's a, bad a good question. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. yeah. Not had that before? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I would just like to say a big thank you again to everyone who listens to our podcast. We really appreciate it. Please continue to leave reviews and pass our podcast on to your friends and family. Thank you so much for taking the uh, time to chat with us today, Connor. We really appreciate it and enjoyed speaking with you and it uh, means so much to us as a school to be able to have the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for having me. No at all. Wow, Sorted? Yes. All right. We always get you to sign a few. Yeah, that's cool. Things, so. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Wow. There you go. All right, fellas. Thank you for having me. Thanks for yeah, coming no in. No problem. It's only around the corner, isn't it, for you? Is it? Yeah. Five minutes. That's not. Yeah. Took uh-huh. us all good to try and park. Good driving. <laughs> <laughs> well done, boys. Yeah. Good, that. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? It's all right? Yeah. Well, I hope it's happening. Um, stop.